Okay. Order, um, members. Uh, we are now in a public session, and I welcome you to this afternoon's meeting of the Public Accounts Committee. Mobile phones must be switched to airplane mode or turned off. It is not sufficient to put mobiles on silent mode as they continue to interfere with assembly recording. This session is being recorded in video and audio and can be accessed via uh, online streaming either on the assembly website or Democracy Live. So, as I've said, we're now in public session and agenda item one is apologies. Have we any apologies today? Full House. Item 2, minutes of the 3rd of December 2020, which are in your packs, pages 6 to 10. Um, are members content that I sign those minutes? Okay. Um, agenda item 3 is the declaration of members' interests. Members at each meeting, members are required to register relevant financial and other interests in the re uh, register of members' interests. Do any members have any interest they wish to declare this afternoon? Okay, to end item four uh, is matters arising in your pack, pages 13 to 23. Members, last week we noted restricted correspondence dated the 1st of December 2020 uh, from Zara Long, the Chief Executive of the EA, in your pack, pages 13 to 22, regarding further information on uh, the ongoing internal EHR process and the impact this may have on progressing the recommendations coming out of the Northern Ireland Audit Office reports. Ms Long has provided in her letter response specific and detailed information in Appendix 1 regarding the process that has been achieved since the imp sorry the progress has been achieved since the um, implementation of the statutory operations improvement plan in 2020. Um, and can I just remind you that this uh, information must be treated in confidence. Um, are members content that the questions have been answered? Or are members any comments? I have to say, from my perspective, um, I'm not entirely convinced that the, the language is clear and we have the clarity and certainty that the ongoing uh, EHR investigation, which obviously we do not want to in any way interfere with, impinge on, uh, is uh, not. Uh, uh, separated fully from the, the, the desire of this committee and the Education Committee around um, an, an independent inquiry. Uh, whilst w I welcome the, the detail that um, Sir Long provides, I do not believe it provides that certainty. Any other member um, have an opinion on that? Mr Hilditch? Sure, again, I would share your concerns uh, in relation to, to the response. Uh, and certainly it's something that we need to keep a very close, close eye on as things progress. And I know we decided we weren't initially bringing uh, Ms Long back uh, before the committee on this one, but we, we really need to be careful. This is a very sensitive subject, and we really need to be careful that we seem to do as much as we can to uh, progress improvements in this field. Yeah. Yeah, I have to say, what we need to keep at the forefront of our minds and not lose sight of is the young people out there who are being uh, affected, uh, many of them um, potentially negatively around this issue. This is hugely important and significant and serious for the young people and their families and the schools uh, that are involved. So I want absolute clarity, and I think this committee has asked for that. And if you remember, the Education Committee wrote to this committee uh, uh, as well, asking that we get that. So I think we need to ask the Chief Executive with respect to provide that clarity. The members agreed? Okay. Further than a member of the Board of Governors to lay a I too am go <coughs> yeah. I think the, 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 those of us who are governors at schools declaring interest, I think they've all been recorded before in which schools they are. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Then we move on to um, our correspondence then is dated the fourth of December twenty twenty and your uh, page twenty three of your pack uh, received from John Walsh. Uh, has everyone got that? Uh, the Town Solicitor of Belfast City Council. Mr Waltz makes reference to the meeting of the Safety Technical Group 
uh, when the proposed design for Casement Park was discussed. Mr Waltz also states the Council has not had sight of any traffic management plan. Um, members, any comments? Mr Hillage. Uh, it's sort of it's getting sort of like ticky tack here. It's, uh, I think we need to again seek further reassurance that everything is going well on that front. Uh, this is a major, major project which is going to cost millions, hundreds of millions of pounds to complete. And I see that that meeting was basically to initially uh, discuss with the emergency services from the side group who were present in relation to road management. We really need something a wee bit stronger so that we know as a committee who are aware of the previous problems that these previous problems are being dealt with in totality. And that, he says at the end, I'm sorry, I can't not be of any more help, and I can understand that because it, that's only one small part of the, the input of the City Council and the side group. Yeah. Any other member? The thing, the thing that struck me there in the um, first major paragraph is, however, the Council has a statute requirement to issue a safety certificate for a designated sports ground under the provisions of the Safety of Sports Grounds Northern Ireland Order 20, 2006. Um, and then the uh, penultimate paragraph, as far as I am aware, the planning and discussion with the emergency service at the Safety Technical Group was used to inform traffic management plan, which the Council has not sight of. Not had sight of. I, I, don't, I don't think that's consistent with the advice in the, that this committee got from the Department for Communities when, when senior officials from the Department came in. But yet the, plan, the, the planning minister has obviously issued an approval on that road yeah. system, and that's where it's absolutely surprising that Belfast City Council has not got that to mm -hmm. hand. Yeah. They haven't said of. So again, um, sorry, Ms. Flynn. Sure, it was just to suggest to know that um, obviously at the um, the end of the letter, John Mulch is saying are advising to contact um, <clears throat> the department directly as they will have um, the relevant information. So uh, it may be worthwhile setting on, forwarding on our original correspondence that the committee sent to the council with the response that we've had, and hopefully they can yeah. provide <clears throat> us with you know, filling in the gaps, sir. No, I think that. Sorry, Mr. Bates, yeah. that, that may well be the case. But I know if. If I were a councillor or a councillor staff giving approval for such a scheme, there would be a degree of responsibility in your shoulders, and you'd want to know that you personally uh, had sight of all relevant safety information so that everything can be reassured going forward. I think from, from my time on the DGL committee, Mr Hillich was there as well, and can correct me if I'm wrong, I think I've said this to this committee before. Um, the certification for the progression of a, of a sports ground of this nature comes from the council, the local government. Um, we had clear advice given to us when Ms Mahorg and her colleagues were in front of this committee around this issue. Um, uh, from their perspective, it was clear. Uh, a number of us weren't, in terms of the council stuff, as clear. This letter, which should have provided the clarity and certainty, has not done that. So I think the suggestion that um, Ms Flynn has made, is that we write to Ms Mahard asking her uh, to provide that clarification um, because I'm not sure that the, the, the uh, clarification uh, and uh, the certainty is there now, given the evidence that we had from the Council and the failure of Mr Walsh's letter to, to confirm that when he says he, they haven't, Belfast City Council have not have sight of the, the, the piece of work. Agreed? The safeguard is on council and councillors. Well, I think this is, a, this is now a matter, obviously, in the public domain. I think if, if there are members of Belfast City Council, and we all have colleagues in Belfast City Council, I'm sure they will, they will be taking that up. I mean, uh, Mr. Beggs makes uh, a very, very valid point. Okay, so it's agreed that we write to Ms. Mahard asking for clarity and certainty around that. Okay, members, thank you. Um, in terms of, in terms of the, the other issue then, in terms of DFC, uh, we are you content that we write to DFC for information on the traffic management plan as well and ask for that? 
Uh, response to the Communities Committee. Agreed. Okay, thank you. Agenda item five is correspondence, um, pages 25 to 50. I refer to correspondence dated 25th, 26th, and 5th and 6th, 25th, 26th of November, and the 5th and 6th of December 2020 from Edward Cook, pages 25 to 47 of your pack regarding COVID-19 in universities. Members, Mr Cook continues to copy the committee into this correspondence. Mr Cook has two whistleblower complaints. The first one in relation to the lack of Section 75 screening in relation to universities, and the second complaint is with regard to the university's handling of COVID-19. In relation to the first complaint, the committee discussed Mr Cook's concerns in respect of the S75 equality screening uh, in the distribution of the D D D DFE uh, funding to the Northern University sector on the 20th of February. And if you recall, members of the committee forwarded Mr Cook's correspondence to the Economy Committee uh, to consider his uh, issues with regard to uh, Ulster University funding. The committee also wrote to the Comptroller and Auditor General who responded to the committee to advise that his Section 75 concerns could be considered by the Equality Commission uh, and the Freedom of Information request could be considered by the Information Commissioner. Mr Cook was subsequently advised of the Comptroller and Auditor General's response on the 28th of February. With regard to Mr Cook's second complaint, PAC has regularly been copied into correspondence from Mr Cook um, to the Minister for the Economy about universities' handling of COVID-19 and students. The committee has been noting this correspondence, which is being dealt with elsewhere and does not appear within the remit of the Public Accounts Committee. If Mr Cook's most recent correspondence, 26th of November, he has asked the public uh, asked the question if the Public Accounts Committee is kind enough to consider my second whistleblower complaint is worthy of investigation. I give permission for the committee or, or the investigating body to access all emails I have sent from the September 2020 to the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee for the Economy, Belfast City Council's Environmental Health Office, the Health and Safety Executive and the Northern Ireland Audit Office. Members, uh, we are not an investigatory committee, so we will, it would not be appropriate to seek access to all the bodies that Mr Cook has proposed in his letter. Uh, if members are content that we write to Mr Cook acknowledging that, we ha may have, uh, that he may have valid concerns, but uh, the regulations of COVID uh, and other matters raised in relation to universities are not within the remit of this committee. Uh, you are also cont content we, are, we have dealt with Mr Cook's complaint as best we can with regard to Section 75 screening of Ulster University funding and advise Mr Cook of these issues. Um, are members content? Any members any issues to raise? Okay. Thank you. Uh, members, I refer to correspondence uh, 4th of December 2020 from Ms Sue Gray, the Accounting Officer and Permanent Secretary of the Department of Finance, pages 48 to 49 of your pack, in relation to the inquiry in the land web project and digital transformation regarding commercially sensitive information last week. Uh, we noted the correspondence at our meeting last week, dated the 25th of uh, November 2020, from Sue Gray, which can be found at pages 59 to 83 of your pack. Are you content we defer the consideration of this correspondence to agenda uh, item 8 uh, as it is relevant to our draft report on land web and digital transformation? Members agreed? Thank you. Members, I refer to correspondence dated the 4th of December 2020 from Mike Brennan, the Accounting Officer and Permanent Secretary of the Department of the Economy, uh, at page 50 of your pack regarding the Department's input into the recruitment and appointments. Uh, of the Ulster University Council. Mr Brennan states the Department has no input in this process. Now, I know some members were very concerned about this at the time. Any members, any issues you want to raise? Mr Muir. Um, obviously, the, the correspondence confirms what we suspected. Um, the Government supplies a significant amount of funding to Ulster University, and to have no role in terms of the oversight function in relation to that is a matter of concern. Yep. Now, I don't know whether that is a matter for the Economy Committee to follow up, but it is a significant issue in light of also the evidence we took in relation to the Belfast campus. Yep. Mr Banks. I support Mr Muir's views, but also I recall uh, being, being advised of some sort of information saying that uh, council members were 
largely ex-civil servants, and it is important that there is a widespread uh, level of expertise across a wide range of subjects. Uh, we appreciate they're, they're, they're looking to recruit someone with uh, the project management aspect, but equally there are lots of other private sector skills which they have, or they risk falling into other pit holes going forward. So I, I think uh, it's important that it is representative of the wider society rather than just ex-civil servants. So I think there's other issues about uh, the recruitment and the makeup of the council, which receives millions, hundreds of millions of pounds, and indeed in this project alone has cost very significant uh, amounts of money to the public purse. Well, obviously, what we have to be very careful about our members have been uh, in this committee is making comment on what is a very sensitive issue in uh, Ulster University going forward. Um, but members are absolutely right. There is a considerable amount of public taxpayers' money invested in universities across the United Kingdom, and in this case, uh, the Ulster University. Uh, and yet there appears to be, in the response we've had, Mr Brennan, the department has no input in the process. I don't think in this day and age that is actually good enough. Uh, and I think that is something, a gap that needs to be narrowed and indeed closed. And that whilst not all of the money going into universities uh, will be from the public purse, a considerable amount of it is. And so, therefore, I think the department, as a sponsoring department, providing that money should have input in terms of making appointments to serve on that council. Mr. Mr. Boylan, you wish to Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yes, and I was going to raise the, 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 the last paragraph. There, there needs to be some accountability in relation to, because clearly it says the economy department has no role, and that applies right across the board in terms of any department office. And we need, we need to certainly have a conversation. Yep. about that um, later or get some advice or somebody in to discuss that. Okay, well, perhaps in closed, we'll have a discussion on how we, how we take that forward, given the sensitivities of the, the, the issues uh, around uh, that project and the, the evidence that was given in closed session. So I wouldn't want to go further at this stage in open session in case we're um, uh, in breach of that confidentiality. So we'll, we'll return to that later in closed. Okay, thank you. Um, agenda item six then is ministerial direction, the funding of the City of Airport, City of Derry Airport, pages 52 to 57. <coughs> Excuse me, I refer to the letter dated the 2nd of December 2020 from Mr. Kieran Donnelly, Controller and Order General, in the back page, sorry, at the pack in your page 52 to 53, providing details of ministerial direction in respect of the funding for the airport. Uh, also in the pack, pages 53 to 55, is correspondence dated the 16th of November 2020 uh, to the Controller and Auditor General from Katrina Godfrey, Permanent Secretary, uh, at Department of uh, Infrastructure, in relation to the ministerial direction she received from the DFI Minister Nicola Mallon uh, to provide funding to Derry City and Strabane Council to fund the City of Derry Airport. Ms Godfrey since received approval from the uh, Department of Finance that she can provide funding to a maximum of £1.233 million as a 50% contribution towards the minimum necessary costs met jointly between the Council and the Executive of sustaining the airport until March 2021. <coughs> Excuse me, also in the pack at pages 56 to 57, uh, for your reference, is correspondence dated the 3rd of November 2020 from the DFI Minister Nicola Mallon seeking ministerial direction from the Department regarding further funding for City of Derry Airport. And I would invite at this stage Mr Donnelly, the Controller and Auditor General, to brief the committee uh, on the ministerial brief. Uh, um, I think the first thing I would say is direction follow proper process as how direction should be handled. Uh, so uh, it was approved by Department of Finance. There's actually two routes for directions under the rules. Uh, a minister can put, uh, get approval from the full executive or go to finance. Uh, in this case, uh, the Department of the Finance Minister uh, endorsed the, the direction. Um, I think, as you've said, Chair, <coughs> this is emergency uh, funding. Um, obviously, the, the airport is, is impacted significantly with COVID, uh, but there have always been financial health problems with Derry City Airport. And in fact, this is uh, the fourth direction over 20 years. The first one goes back to 
1999, uh, there was one in 2007, and there was one in 2011. Uh, the three previous ones uh, were related to capital investment, you know, uh, repairs to the runway and health and safety. This one is uh, more recurrent uh, to, to, to tide the, the airport over. So there, there, there's not just a problem with COVID, there's been a long running just difficulties balancing the books. And of course, uh, there is a, a subsidy comes through from the uh, the council as well, so it's a big issue for the council as well as the, the department. So this this um, ministerial intervention of 1.2 odd million pounds mm -hmm. is only through to March 2021. Yep. Well, it's emergency funding. Um, traditionally, the, the airport hasn't needed, um, I suppose, revenue funding. As I said, the previous. Central government uh, funds tended to be for one-off capital works. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, but uh, I suppose with COVID, uh, you know, the, the airport would be in a precarious yeah. financial condition, as, okay. as are all airports. Yeah. I suppose the, the the question is what happens in March, and the other thing is, I'm aware that the economy committee. I'm not a member of it, but the economy economy committee, if I understand, the other day uh, had a meeting. Uh, with the chief executives of the three airports in Northern Ireland. Um, I mean, I know we're talking about this, but as any member, I mean, are all the airports in the same position? Mr. Muir, you wanted to come in? Yeah. Uh, support for the airports is to be welcomed um, and because it's a key part of our infrastructure. But the fact that the permanent secretary said that she couldn't be satisfied whether this was value for money, the need for support for the airports, including the city of Derry, could have been easily anticipated. This is an ongoing issue. There's no, you know, when this decision was made on the 2nd of December, there's no clear line in terms of where the pandemic is going to end. So I'm a bit surprised that there wasn't any forecasting around to be able to give assurances that this is a value for money that can be obtained. I, th I think it's important to disentangle yes. the COVID situation from sort of ongoing financial pressures. Uh, there, there's all there, there's sort of a long-term issue there. Just uh, in other words, Derry City Airport um, will not be able to balance its books uh, uh, without public subsidy, and there has been public subsidy mainly through the council for for quite a number of years. Yeah, I think I would come back to that. I said we've known that for a couple of years. Yeah. So why does it require ministerial direction? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Mr McHugh. Uh, just in the Derry, Derry City Airport, and I'm fairly familiar with the background to it as well, too, having been a councillor in that in Derry. And uh, I was a bit surprised by the statement there as well, that where they couldn't sort of... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, regarded as, we'll say, or have the evidence to support it as being value for money. Because what I do know is that uh, the intervention by council and everyone else previously was probably at a figure of roughly about 10 to 11 million, and yet all this contribution to the local economy was somewhere in the region of 18 million. And there was no confusion whatsoever just how vital and important it is to uh, the economy of the Northwest and to the infrastructure and uh, the road that it provides there uh, in terms of access to the northwest, both through road uh, and air uh, and, and every other respect as well, too. Um, and I can't remember the actual term for it. Maybe someone else will be able to uh, explain this to me. But that uh, the central government has a responsibility in terms of being able to offer, at times, to regional airports whenever it's fulfilling, like, um, uh, is this a, a so, like, like a social responsible? I can't remember the terminology. Sorry. Connectivity. Well, no, it's not just connectivity, but it's a, it's a role the central government has there, and they had recognised this uh, whenever they had provided support to City of Derry Airport previously, uh, in terms of its importance and that to the local economy and that there. So. You're absolutely right. Uh, there was separate support uh, for to, for particular routes. Yeah. Uh, but that's separate, uh, that's separate f from this. Um, yes, uh, in all the ministerial directions over the years, uh, the arguments you've mentioned have been cited. Uh, so over and above the, the narrow ground of doing a value for money appraisal, uh, the, the, the case for direction that was, was or for approving a, the thing was always the wider uh, ben on quantifiable benefits uh, and uh, the, the impact on the North West. So that, that's always been the case. Yeah. 
Okay, Mr. Hillage. Sorry, Chair, I was just following off of Mr. Muir there in relation to the situation at the department or the infrastructure committee. We did receive a briefing from the Belfast International folk as well, and you have enlightened us to the fact that uh, all three have now met with the economy committee. Is that right, or the department? So if, if the other, all, others are awarded, will this be something similar coming back or coming to this committee as well? Or there was something ten million pounds set aside for the three airports. Specific to COVID, so does all that need looked at, or what, what's the situation there? Uh, no, I've, there, there's certainly nothing in my inbox on the other airports. So, uh, so I would assume there's no directions on on the other uh, the other two, um, or COVID related ex uh, support related to the other two. So I, the, the, there doesn't seem to be. Mm -hmm. What's your um, opinion, Mr. Donnelly, on the? Assertion by um, Katrina Godfrey uh, around the the issue of um, value for money. Well, I suppose, uh, it's always been the department's assertion that lo um, you couldn't construct a business case to actually have um, you know an economic appraisal to, that would give you a, a positive value for money verdict mm. uh, on the rules as they go for appraisals. Um, no, um, there's arguments uh, wider than that uh, in terms of maybe intangibles, uh, in terms of benefits to the you know the local community uh, in the northwest, uh, and they're usually uh, in these type of directions is usually the wider benefits that you can't put a figure on that uh, are used to uh, to approve a direction. But you would have thought that the permanent secretary would be live to those issues. Uh, she done, but, but she has to, I suppose, do her assessment by the book. And um, you know, if you do a, a, an appraisal by the book, uh, you know, the the, the, the this initial the, the airport isn't going to wipe its face, and uh, financially, it will need ongoing subsidy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I think whatever, so, so that, that's just the fact of life on it. Okay, Mr. Beggs. Can we just clarify? <coughs> um, there was an announcement of funding for Belfast City Airport and Derry City Airport a number of months ago. So that that didn't did that did that not receive ministerial direction? Was that uh, through normal channels? That uh, that, that would presume is through normal channels. So, uh, so, there was so, so presumably then, the way you would read that is uh, the permanent site could justify so, so that. So they, they signed it off. That's they signed it off. So, yeah. The, the the issue of um, mm -hmm. uh, signing off something that we all have to be live to is uh, Northern Ireland is a relatively small region. The question is, can we afford three airports? And I would have thought, uh, particularly with the upgrade of the A5, COVID, low projections going forward, uh, there will be significant financial pressures going forward and harder to justify Northern Ireland having, um, like, for instance, Dublin, that whole area has one airport, uh, very wide reach right up. In fact, people from all over Northern Ireland travel to Dublin. Yeah. Mr. O'Toole. Um, how many ministerial directions relating to COVID have there been in Northern Ireland? I, um, I don't think uh, I, I brought three of them to you uh, earlier this year. Uh, so there was a cluster of them uh, from the, mainly the Department of Economy uh, earlier in the year. I think we had one in the Department of Finance. Uh, I'll come back to you with full details on that. There have been several of them. Just looking at the. We don't. One interesting thing is the Northern Ireland Executive doesn't maintain a, a landing page for ministerial directions in general, whereas the UK government does. And you can see if you go to the UK government website um, that in relation to COVID-19, there have been well, about nearly 20. That's correct. Uh, ministerial, including eat out to help out, including uh, many from the Department of Transport. So it's worth confirming that. There have been many, to address Mr. Muir's point, there have been many ministerial directions in relation to COVID-19 spending. Uh, that's absolutely right. Uh, you make a good point there, um, 
there's probably more public transparency in GB around directions, so maybe there is something we can pick from that, that uh, all, all directions should be publicly available and you can get them in one place on a, on a website. Is, is it routine practice that directions are set, directions do have to be sent to you by... Yes, uh, under managing public money, um, if there is a direction, and um, the rules are a wee bit different here in Northern Ireland than GB. Uh, in GB, the, I suppose the buck stops with the, the minister of the department. They, they will sign a direction. Uh, here, it has to go through an extra layer. So the direction, uh, there are two routes. Uh, so the, the minister cannot um, just make a direction on their own. Uh, the other is to get the, 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 the approval of the executive as a, a whole, or alternatively, they can go to the finance minister, uh, and we, we've had both routes here, so that, that's the process. I mean, did did um, Ms Mallon go to the finance uh, because the first route wasn't successful, or was the first route not chosen? Uh, I have no... Um, I, I don't think there was any consideration. That's just the way it happened. So right. I'm not aware okay. of okay. the. Well, uh, I, I, I yeah. think, to be, to be fair, I remember members when we were discussing COVID uh, when it first hit, uh, and, and when this committee decided not to meet for a number of weeks, if you remember, to allow senior officials to deal with the pandemic and the emergency that was arising. I did make the point from this chair at that time members needed to be mindful and that the audit office needed to be mindful around the fact that civil servants were having to make legislation in days and weeks as opposed to months and that we needed, when, when time would flow, we needed to, to bear that in mind when we come to scrutinise these things. So I'm not uh, entirely um, uh, without, without um, concern or sympathy on this point. But the point... Uh, the point, the point that, that I would take from the, this letter is I would like to get clarification if the route was, um, because this has come to this committee, it's our duty to, to, to deal with it. If consideration was given by the minister, Ms Godfrey might be able to answer that, to go to colleagues and ask um, for that collective agreement, or was it just the choice of going directly to finance and and, and doing it that way. And the second thing that, that uh, I would share the concerns, um, when you get a letter from a permanent secretary saying uh, that around the issue of uh, value for money, I think that's something where at least a question needs to be asked. Mr. Tew. Chair, um, I don't know. Okay, I think you were still under general when a pol there was a policy that was brought in in 2011. I think it was formally introduced in 2012, which was around air passenger duty and the devolution of long haul air passenger duty to Northern Ireland, um, which happened. And we have a effectively lower rate of uh, air passenger duty here than the rest of the UK, but we don't have any long haul routes and haven't had for um, two or three years now. That costs, I believe, our budget. Two and a half million pounds a year. I just wondered, was, it, was, was there a ministerial direction then that you recall? With respect, we, we are dealing with this letter and this issue. Yeah, I, I, I can see what you're doing. We're dealing with this issue and this correspondence. We're not going to talk about our passenger duty, however sympathetic okay. I may be to the point you're making. We'll deal with the correspondence in front of us. Okay. So, um, um, I, 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 or, I mean, I think a letter to Ms. Godfrey asking for those clarifications. Would be at least at this committee to do. Are we agreed? Agreed. Okay. Thank. Except in the letter it says the value for money. In light of what what Kieran has said on my colleague actually, in the value and turnover, in relation to the investment on the overall turnover and contribution, surely that should play a part of the the process. Uh, Mr. McHugh said that. There was an investment of 10 million and there was an 18 million turnover, return. Does that play a part in terms of the overall uh, sequence, in terms of assessing exactly what value for money is? That's I think it does. I suppose you're getting in then to weigh up the cost of uh, support with uh, wider benefits to the economy. 
uh, and uh, how you actually quantify that uh, and as to whether there's a difference of view uh, between the department and, and the council and that that is uh, so so yeah I, I, I know in the past there have been these assessments to to, to quantify wider benefits to tourism and whatever. Uh, there wouldn't be in the narrow ground of uh, an appraisal. Uh, so you, you do an appraisal, it's uh, essentially, well, the, the narrow ground of the appraisal is uh, will the project actually be financially sustainable? Uh, but uh, the argument usually for wider subsidy would be around wider benefits, including tourism benefits, that sort of thing. Uh, those benefits will not accrue to the airport or to the council. So, uh, and it's a debate on how you measure that, yeah. uh, and there could be a difference of opinion on, on, the, the, on the that. The multiplier, yeah. yeah. Okay, um, Mr. Muir. But I would agree with the points that Kyle has made. It's, it's a wider sort of appraisal needs to be done. But it's important to ask these questions because at least one of the other airports have asked them why did the City of Derry get our, our airport get money under this ministerial direction, and we haven't. So it's important. And, to go and, back I, and, and I think and I think that's an absolutely valid point for them to make to make that. To be fair, yeah. uh, and so in this in this letter and correspondence, um, the multiplier is important. Uh, you know, it's, it's the reason why big events are brought to Northern Ireland, because what it puts in and the add-on, as it ripples out, high investments say, one pound by the public purse generating ten pounds in the private sector and all of that. That's hugely important. And that, so I think the questions we need to ask is, why was this route chosen and not, not the collective round the table uh, in terms of by the minister? Um, and in terms of the, the, the ask why the permanent secretary was concerned about VFM, uh, the point you raise in terms of the multiplier effect. And I think another question that I, I would like to ask is, what happens when we get to March as well? OK. OK, thank you. Um, OK, members. So at this point, uh, we will continue in closed session to consider the paper regarding the inquiry into capacity and capability in the Northern Ireland Civil Service. We will now close our public session.